Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, friends and colleagues from across the world. My name is Dr. Keanu Shaw. I'm a proud dentist and will be serving as the moderator for today's Hex Commission meeting. The meeting is called to order. In representation of the noble professions are Dr. Gerard Morris, Medicine, Dr. Emily Latron, Dentistry, Dr. John Cryack, Pharmacy, Dr. Andrew Royer, Optometry, Dr. Alan Chong, Chiropractic, Dr. Ora Mbarus, Philosophy. Welcome. The Global Summits Institute was founded based on the idea that doctors should be overseeing and administrating the healthcare industry. What has perpetuated the formation of the Hex Commission was years of listening to our colleagues complain about their common problems, but not much has been done or offered in a cohesive and structured effort. To advance our mission and vision, we have partnered up with our colleagues from other healthcare professions. And in the future, we will be rotating moderators and representatives to bring their perspectives to the table. It is important to note that we are healthcare. We also have other major talents, such as many of doctor colleagues are accountants, lawyers, public servants, innovators, and more. We can create a sustainable and self-sufficient system to overcome all of our challenges. Many third parties have no place in our operatories, which leads to interference with the sacred patient-doctor relationship. Executives in boardrooms have no rights to influence diagnosis, directly or indirectly, take any ownership or guide the future of the healthcare industry. Although they may have had a good run for 40 years in the corporatization of medicine and healthcare, the tides are turning and we must step up to the plate. It's a reset time. In 2020, we have reached over 3, millions of, 3 million of our colleagues to the love of continuing education. Let's double and triple that in 2021. Today, we start with medicine, the lion's share of the healthcare industry. Dr. Gerald Morris, you have the floor for 10 minutes to discuss the challenges that our colleagues face in medicine. Please proceed. Hi, hi. good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Shah and Dr. Latran for inviting me to be able to speak on behalf of my medicine colleagues uh, uh, in the US and also around the world because we all face the same issues, I'm sure. So I'm a board certified internal medicine physician. I am practicing here in the US uh, in Tucson, Arizona, been in practice for over a decade and uh, have seen a lot of changes that have taken place in the healthcare industry in that short space of time. So what I wanna talk about today um, for my time is just a few of those issues that I think that I have identified on my own. I also talking to other docs um, that are plaguing our industry. I mean, the first thing I see uh, personally was the lack of the entrepreneurial spirit that we need uh, and needed in medicine. This has led to a reduction in practice autonomy. So for my, for my example, I remember in residency when I was a third year resident about to go out into the world of primary care, I would ask my program director, hey, you know what, when am I gonna learn how to run a practice? And the answer I always got back from everyone who was above me was just focus on the medicine. And that's good, and we did. But when you get out into the real world, not being able to know how to run a practice is, is, is definitely detrimental to your health as a physician and as a doctor by and large. Another thing we saw was the bureaucracy of medicine. We all live in it, whether it's EMRs, whether it's dealing with uh, declining reimbursements, dealing with the health insurance industry, everything has become this huge, huge 800 pound gorilla in the room that, that is not leaving enough space for doctors to be able to practice the way they were taught uh, to do all through their many, many years of schooling. Then another one I, I, I tend to see and I actually identify with a little bit is burnout. I mean, no matter what sector you're in, whether you're in medicine like myself or dentistry or any other of, of the other esteemed colleagues we have here, we all experience some level of burnout. And if we look at 2020, that was a specifically tortuous year for all of us here in medicine. And, and, and I did some digging and Medscape did a, a burnout and suicide report in 2020. And some of the, the data that they pulled is, is pretty alarming. After you know, interviewing 15,000 uh, physicians, the docs in the age group 40 to 54 they reported the highest rates of burnout at, four, at 48%. And I mean, that's, that's, that's alarming to say the least. And the top three reasons they cited was, like I said, the red tape of bureaucracy, 
uh, the, the long hours of, of, of being up all night trying to document in charts. And, and the other one was just not being able to be with their families as much as they would have liked. Um, and how docs deal with burnout? Not very well. Almost half of them surveyed isolated themselves, did not seek the help that they needed. And, and that's alarming in, in, in itself. And you found that the majority of docs who were in the burnout mode or who were suffering from burnout were in employed positions. And that's something I want all of us to take a look at and also think about for the long-term and the health of the healthcare sector in this country and in the world. Another thing we worry about and we have seen an issue with is, is, is profession scope creep. Now, what that is, is that's pretty much, in my opinion, fueled by big corporations who want to put people in, in positions who technically or to them are cost effective in terms of the bottom line. And whether, uh, and, and I mean, which I decided the aisle you're on, it's important to recognize that, you know, when you're a physician or a doctor and you're trained to do a job, this is something that you take to heart and to have it stripped away from you. Because once again, someone in a, the 20th floor of some big building decides, you know what, he's costing too much. I'll put three in his place that cost a third of what he is just to get uh, the profit. That's not good. That's something we need to definitely fight against. And the last thing I think that, that I, we, we do need to, 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 to speak to is the lack of camaraderie between physicians and other doctors. We are bred to be uh, lions, alphas. And what happens in residency, what I experienced is you had three spots for fellowship dangled in front of 25 residents. And, and that does not lead to us coming together as a group and saying, you know what, we'll work together to do something. And, and that's the mentality that, that has been bred in us from going through medical school all the way up to our professional life. And I mean, I've seen it myself where it, it, it doesn't lead to after residency being able to, 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 to grow as a, as, a, as, a, as a society, as a group, because everyone is thinking he's out for my position, she's out for my position. And that's not the way it is. And what that leads to more isolation, which we don't need anymore in our industry, in medicine. And um, those are the five ones that, uh, that I have seen that really stuck out to me in, 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 in my practice for the last 10 years, things that I've experienced personally, and also talking to other physician colleagues who are dealing with the same thing. Uh, at this point, I want to yield back to Dr. Shah to take us to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morris. Uh, those were excellent points raised that we hear about. Um, with uh, a we're going to go ahead and move now to the next uh, profession in dentistry. Um, uh, perhaps Dr. Latron uh, could uh, uh, give us the, the blueprint of the issues there so they can be further discussed. Uh, with that said, Dr. Latron, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I am absolutely honored to be here uh, as part of the panel representing dentistry. And um, just a little bit about myself. I've been practicing for 28 years, graduated from UCLA. I originally came from Vietnam, and uh, I have the, 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 the blessing of being educated in this country and seeing how the healthcare change and now being really part uh, of a private, uh, pivotal part of the healthcare system. Um, in dentistry, I would say there are the five things. There are a lot of challenges, obviously, for everybody, but I want to mention five. The very first one is insurance. Uh, as we all know, our world has started revolving around a lot of insurance and uh, the insurance dictates treatment, uh, coverage, frequency, when you can do certain treatment, uh, sometimes treatment choices, uh, treatment limitations, where you can go, whether or not you can, get, you can see an expert, a specialist. Um, so that's one of the big thing that I see. The second one, is the competition versus collaboration. We all know that collaboration will help us go further than competition. But you know, sometimes when you're when you're busy, when you're in a very competitive um, environment, like I'm in Southern California, there are four dentists at each corner. Um, uh, uh, you know, at every corner of the street. Uh, what do you do? So instead of really uh, chasing each other to the bottom line, which is to advertise for the cheapest, you know, treatment, maybe using the cheapest lab, 
uh, what can we do to collaborate with each other? And, and it's really it go back to the first one. How do we eliminate some of the third party middleman uh, people so that we ourselves can dictate what we want and that we would truly just serve the patients and not, you know, the, the, the insurance company. Um, the third one that I see is patient education. Uh, with the advance in technology, uh, some of us are still lagging in communicating with our patients. This is why the patients go and listen to an ad, right? Um, in Southern California, you, you could be driving and see a big ad, implant for $3.99. And I don't know what that cost would cover, uh, maybe my assistant, uh, I, you know, because when you do a surgical procedure uh, with high tech, um, with certain system, you got to be able to take care of that cost, to take care of your overhead, and still have the leftover so you can pay for yourself and, uh, and you know, take care of your family. So these kind of patient education where, where it's, mis it's really is misleading to the patient, thinking that they can go anywhere and at a cheaper place, uh, I don't want to say cheaper, it's, it's poorer quality, um, that's up to up to interpretation, but that is something that we all we're not doing as well as good of a job educating our patients. And sometimes, especially in dentistry, we spend money on, you know, the toys, the laser, uh, the cone beam. We spend a lot of money on those, and then we're not spending money on educating our patients. Maybe you need to invest in a system, um, a telehealth, teledentistry. You know, let them know before you they get bombarded by, I don't know how many things out there um, that are misleading to them, that, that make them think that they can go anywhere and get the same, uh, the same kind of treatment. Where, where sometimes we hear people say, oh, you know, because you have a quote cheap insurance, uh, that you're gonna get bad treatment. And uh, personally, I don't agree with that because that is a personal choice. And just because somebody have uh, a a cheap insurance, the insurance that maybe an HMO, it doesn't make that person a cheap person. I happen to practice in the San Gabriel Valley uh, in Southern California. A lot of my patients are uh, engineers that work for JPL. Um, they are researchers that work at City of Hope. They are teachers that are teaching my kids. So, but they all have sometimes a certain kind of HMO. Um, that doesn't mean that they choose that, sometimes that's the only option that their workplace is, is giving them. So it is up to our profession to educate the patient, to let them know that they have options, to let them know that there are different, more than one ways of doing things. And then it's up to the patient to choose which treatment they want. And sometimes what they're gonna choose is no treatment. They're gonna let that thing go, right? And then we end up taking care of the emergency. But uh, we, I, I feel that we are not doing as good of a job education, um, educating our patient. Um, the fourth one that I see is excessive government regulation. Um, I believe there are certain basic level of regulation that we have to follow. Uh, the you know certain industry standards. Uh, but sometimes when government is dictating too much and, and for example, we were facing a pandemic and uh, if the government tells everybody to stay home, which I, I'm okay with that, but sometimes there's a, there's a fear factor in there. Um, the, the patients, uh, even though they are well, they are not compromised and they got a broken tooth, for example, they are scared. I actually had a patient calling me up and say, Dr. Letran, I need to cancel my appointment uh, because, you know, the governor just said everybody should stay home, right? And, and obviously that's a personal decision and I respect that. But I think, again, it goes back to, to patient education, helping them understand that it's very, very important to, uh, to take care of themselves. And then they make that decision whether or not they're going to be listening um, to government regulations or, or recommendations up to a certain point yes but when when it start getting affecting how we take care of our patients I think it makes it really hard for us as private practitioners and the fifth one um, and I think my my colleague uh, uh, dr. Morris touched on this 
is the lack of education for us. And by that, what I mean specifically is in business administration, in business training, uh, we, we spend years learning our clinical skills. And then when we come out, we don't even know how to interview a staff. Um, we don't even know how to uh, read a PNL. I, I was very blessed in learning some of those things fast because I was working in busy, in busy offices and I, I had a chance to observe someone, right? But if I was to start by myself, then it would basically be guessing. And I had the opportunity to buy a practice early in my career. So I was forced to learn <laughs> some of these documents because I need to understand them in order to make, uh, to, to buy it. And again, if you are by yourself um, and you're not communicating with others, you don't have the support and you're trying to guess or you just listen to, uh, let's say social media, or you listen to whichever uh, consultant that bring you uh, that you bring in, and that may not may may not be the best person to be advising you. Then you are sort of at the mercy of, you know, outside influencers. Um, if we have a platform, a program where we can help the doctors understand that, guide them in the right direction, tell them that it is more important to learn the business than the clinical. Uh, because you can always, you will always get better at the clinical, but the business, unless you start out on the right foot, uh, you could be facing a lot of challenges. And um, so those are some of the things that I see that are challenging in dentistry. And um, I want to share that and hopefully we'll get some feedback from my colleagues uh, to how to deal with that. And I would like to give the floor back to Dr. Shah. Thank you so much, Dr. Latron. I, uh... Uh, agree that uh, most of our colleagues face similar challenges and we will uh, discover that in our roundtable discussion. Thank you for that presentation. Um, next is a very dear industry to all of us, uh, um, the, the medication and the pharmacy that helps uh, heal our patients. Um, uh, Dr. John Cryack will be representing the profession of pharmacy. You have the floor. Thank you, Kianor, and um, uh, thank you, Commission. So, um, you know, one of the things that I see a lot is I see for my first um, five. So we're also we're all talking about five. I want to put three together and that would be polypharmacy um, unnecessary adverse offense and um, lack of communication between providers. So I kind of want to give you a little bit of a scenario. So you have a patient that is going to see that um, has a primary care provider and then they're going and seeing three and four uh, specialists. Um, and each one of those specialists will prescribe a medication. And um, a lot of times you will see drug-drug interactions that are occurring. One, and because of the lack of communication between providers, where um, the primary care provider doesn't want to call the uh, specialist or vice versa, what you see is patients receiving multiple medications, often which interact. And uh, because of that, what you're seeing is an increase in the amount of unnecessary adverse events and hospitalizations for the patients. Um, you know, what, what, what I have seen on too many instances is that whenever, um, even while working in pharmacy, you know, calling one physician or another, there is a lot of, um, uh, I would say, animosity or question, why are you wanting to change my med? that you should be changing that other person's med or why are you going to do that or do that? And as opposed to actually sitting down and going through the patient's profile and looking at what is in the best interest of the patient. Um, and part of this issue also has to do with um, the patients and the way that um, media um, has portrayed it um, for many. Um, and for example, if you go to the doctor's office and you are going to be, um, and you're paying a copay, you expect to get something for that. You expect to get a medication for that. And that is really leading to, and also contributing to the issue of polypharmacy. Um, it is not uncommon for an average person to be receiving anywhere from eight to 10 medications. Now you take that patient and you put them into an institutional type setting, such as a nursing home, or say some of your um, at-home palliative care patients, these patients can be, can be receiving upwards of 16 to 20 medications. Um, 
And, you know, if you begin to take a look at some of the reports that have been coming out and what you will actually be seeing in um, uh, many of the hospitals is, why is it that these patients are showing up in the emergency room? And in many instances, it is because of the fact that they are falling. Um, you know, you, they're receiving multiple medications, for example, that cause dizziness or can cause dementia, uh, especially in the elderly population. And a lot of it, I mean, what you begin to see is also going back to that issue of polypharmacy is the prescribing cascade that occurs because of the lack of communication between providers. So a scenario might be the patient goes and sees their primary care provider, and then um, they'll go and see a specialist. The specialist prescribes a medication. The patient experiences a side effect. Okay, well, depending on what type of side effect they're experiencing, they may go to one of their existing providers or go to another provider, and then they prescribe a medication. And then you start seeing this downward spiral and this increase in the medication, um, the uh, number of medications that the uh, patients have, um, all of which, um, in, in my opinion, leads to a poor outcome for the patients and a poor quality of life. Um, now, with that being said, now let's address the other two issues that were somewhat addressed by, um, by my um, uh, two colleagues previous to me. Uh, number one, of course, is um, insurance. Um, but I'm not going to look at it as in terms of uh, for not being paid for. I'm looking at it more of a formulary issue. You know, in the area where I live right now, you've got five and six different insurance companies. And each one of them has a preferred medication for hypertension or diabetes um, or seizure disorder. Now, where does that come in? And, 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 and it's that formulary. Obviously, you know, some of the preferred ones are going to be those that are inexpensive, but the branded name medications, you know, I think there's a little bit of an influence from big pharma because obviously that drug company that wants to come in and have their medication on that formulary, because that means that when a doctor prescribes a medication, what you're going to see is, is that it's not covered. So then, the, the doctor has an option, the physician has an option, and that is prescribe one that is similar within a class or fill out a number of forms or go through a long process for a patient to have that medication. And all too often, what you will actually see is, you know what, it's similar. It's, a, um, um, it's an angiotensin II receptor blocker. Eh, they're all somewhat the same, but uh, there are some subtle differences between the medications which can be very important for patients, especially whenever you get into the realm of your psychotropics. Um, and all of the previous four things that I mentioned, the polypharmacy, the um, unnecessary side effects, the lack of communication, and the formulary issues, all of which leads to increasing medication costs and overall increased healthcare costs, um, which is, you know, is something that all of us pay for. Um, no matter what field that you're in, you can actually see that your healthcare costs are going up. For those of us that own our own businesses who pay for insurance for our employees, you see the costs rising every year and the benefits to the patients going down each year. And why is that? It's because of the overall increase in healthcare costs. And many of those things can be mitigated I would think the first step, which I will address here um, a little later, is be uh, to um, have an increase in communication. Um, but so those are five issues that I see. Um, and I, I'm actually pretty passionate about all five of those because the ultimate reason why each of us is here on this uh, call today or, or this um, uh, uh, webinar today is because we want to improve outcomes for our patients. We are all here to help our patients and figure out a way in which we can do that. So I would like to uh, turn that back over to um, my esteemed colleague, Kianor. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that thorough presentation. Uh, passion makes the world go around. Um, that's what we need is passion about our industries. We have invested our lives 
and careers too. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that presentation. Now the next one, um, vision, uh, diligence. Without uh, our friends, uh, would have a lot of problems in optometry. Um, with uh, uh, the next uh, profession to be represented by Dr. Andrew Royer, uh, optometry. You have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, thank you for the commission for the invitation and opportunity to represent optometry. Um, a little bit about myself, um, Dr. Andrew Royer. I've been in um, practicing for 16 years. I've uh, been in multiple settings. Um, the commercial, private practice, starting cold, and um, now in a um, multi-specialty uh, group setting. Uh, the challenges that I see I faced uh, myself and um, continually see this occur to uh, our colleagues, um, insurance is the biggest uh, issue. Um, insurance affects patient care, patient access to care, and continually increased healthcare costs. Um, there's a number of um, subdivisions under this category. Uh, reimbursements uh, is the first one. Continual measure, measures are taken to cut reimbursements, uh, reimbursement rates on services, diagnostic tests, and procedures. Just a few days ago on the 7th of the, of the month, the American Optometric Association reports a joint effort with the American Medical Association uh, and among other groups to support legislation that would stop the pending Medicare payment cuts to optometrists and other providers during uh, the pandemic. This is necessary uh, to halt any payment reductions that could inadvertently limit patient access to care or further exacerbate the financial instability uh, to to uh, of the healthcare providers. Um, along those lines with reimbursement goes, I'm sure everyone uh, has probably heard of vision insurance, similar to dental insurance, medical insurance. There is a significant difference in the reimbursement rates uh, that we are forced to either take or um, not be a, a provider for um, on vision insurance. For example, um, a, new, a new or existing patient 92004-92014 code, um, it's the same code that you use in, um, in, with medical insurance. There is a anywhere from a 25 to 55% reduction in those reimbursements from a vision insurance. Um, also, they require a bundling of fees um, with other uh, CPT codes. Um, under Also under the insurance would be prior authorizations. Unfortunately, uh, as a doctor, we really are in not much control of what medications our patients are on uh, to treat the ailments that they have. And patients are really at the mercy of their insurance provider as to what, it, what medications they can be on. Uh, these prior authorizations uh, the hoops that you have to jump through um, really affect patient care and um, the, the resources that it takes on a practice uh, can, are, are astronomical. Um, in a four doctor setting like, the, like that I'm in now, uh, we have nearly one full-time staff member per provider to uh, assess and uh, handle the prior authorizations. That's not just medication, it's the diagnostic testing and procedures um, that you have to get the prior authorization for. They can also be um, very difficult and time consuming. Credentialing is an issue um, with both optometry, well, uh, discrepancies uh, with optometry and ophthalmology uh, for the, the same type of uh, service that would be rendered. Becoming a panel member uh, is difficult. Some insurances will only work with ophthalmology. Um, some insurances will uh, limit um, provider, uh, providers to the panel um, because of saturation in the market. 
And then uh, lastly, under the insurance would be the covered versus non-covered benefits, discrimination and discrepancies between ophthalmology and optometry on covered services, diagnostic tests and procedures. Uh, there are numerous insurance companies that will pay for a procedure, even though it's within the scope of practice for ophthalmology, but they will not cover that same procedure for an optometrist to provide that, where there are other medical insurances that do provide that uh, and provide that reimbursement. Uh, the next category I have is uh, state licensure and a unified scope of practice from state to state. Um, if you look at the number of states across um, the US, we, uh, you, you cannot, some states optometrists cannot practice the full scope of their training uh, due to the limitations that state has. Um, and uh, you can also, it can be difficult to take your um, state licensure and go to a different state. So reciprocity, um, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to do that um, from a previous state to uh, St. Louis, where I'm at in Missouri. Um, so, but that's not, not the case for a number of our colleagues. Next would be online retail and services. Uh, the, the pandemic really put a spotlight on telemedicine. There's definitely a place for telemedicine. Uh, definitely in the eye care field and other uh, professions. But we have to be careful on, on the education that the patients are getting, um, knowing that this may or may not be a, a, a good, um, good enough, uh, sorry, um, I lost my train of thought there. So, um, this, the, but the, it may not be a substitute uh, for the, the true physical examination. Um, we really need to, as a profession, improve our relationship uh, with the medical community, um, what services we provide as optometry, uh, the benefits that we have uh, acting as a, um, general practitioner almost for the eye industry. Um, we, we, there are a lot of things that we can do to help uh, patients with their systemic disease and um, reporting that back to the primary care physician for um, the appropriate follow-up and care with them. Lastly, student loan debt. Uh, student loan debt is um, a significant problem for new candidates, new optometrists coming out of school. Um, it, that student loan debt, and I'm kind of going to couple in with lack of practice management um, experience and education, makes it difficult to go into a private practice setting, makes it difficult to open a private practice right out of school. Um, it makes it um, Difficult and going into a commercial setting makes it a little bit more appealing when you can have a, um, a guaranteed paycheck if you're not fortunate enough to get into a, um, a group setting um, or a, an existing practice. Um, so those are the areas that I see and um, thank you for the opportunity and I will send this back to Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Dr. Rick. Fascinating to listen to, uh, to you and to the colleagues prior uh, speak as you uh, pretty much uh, have very common, if not the same issues that we faced. Uh, and those five uh, were also very, very thorough. Thank you for that presentation. We will get to the solutions uh, pretty soon in our roundtable discussion. The next topic is our, our friends uh, from the chiropractic world. Um, a very um, kind and uh, and successful business person, as well as clinician, Dr. Alan Chong, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw, and for Dr. Latran, who invited me to and the um, the other Hex Commission 
um, colleagues. I, I look forward to uh, working with you and presenting ideas that will both be interesting and challenging. To our viewers, uh, I hope you're getting a lot of uh, commonality and differences from our presentations. I've been in practice, clinical practice for 33 years, graduated from Canadian Memorial at Toronto, Canada. I now practice in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So it's a little bit different system, but there's many systems in the world that are modeled and represented here. So um, I um, also have, um, uh, you know, with 33 years of practice, I still don't know it all, that's for sure. But I've seen the profession, our profession change a lot. And uh, one of the things I've, I've host is a, a podcast called Practice Mastery. And in that, we address some of the issues and, and talk to other practitioners and other professionals, guest experts about uh, issues. And there's some interesting commonalities that, that are coming out. Now, in um, particular with chiropractic, I've identified five major areas of concern in no particular order, but there are some similarities in the first three. One is that what is a chiropractor? It's a bit of an identity crisis in a sense, because uh, there, when I ask 10 people, what is, what is a chiropractor? I think the commonalities are uh, that we deal with the spine and that we help people out of back pain. That's what we're kind of known for. But if you go in various different parts of the world, in some parts of the world, there is no such thing as chiropractic because it's been met very medically suppressed um, and medical societies and organizations have basically shut it down, which is, I believe is, a, is not only a concern, but it's that if that isn't an identity crisis, what is? So I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but that certainly is a huge problem. So what do chiropractors offer and to whom is a bit of a unique to chiropractic identity thing. And I call it an identity crisis because among chiropractors, um, I mean, we're not gonna get perfect unity nor will we get perfect agreement. That's not the whole point. But when the general public in the world does not really know what a chiropractor does and in some uh, fields of and organizations within chiropractic, there's major disagreement in what chiropractors should be doing. So let me give you a quick understanding from a practicing chiropractor's standpoint is that we specialize in the spine. However, we also have a lot of, of training and, and knowledge in the, the different parts of, of, of the body, if you will, mainly from an alignment and a function standpoint. For the most part, chiropractic is a drug free, even though there are some jurisdictions uh, in the US particular, particularly, and I believe uh, Switzerland and a few other European uh, Union uh, countries that can actually have limited prescription uh, rights. And then uh, some chiropractors with advanced training can actually perform acupuncture and do, do uh, um, dry needling and, and uh, other things. And then the use of various modalities like laser, ultrasound, interferential current, all those, those are quite common to chiropractic now. However, the, the, the non-prescription, non drug uh, practice is pretty well the the it is the most common way that chiropractic is practiced so you know because there's so much diversity uh, it leaves us in a bit of a quandary that the general public doesn't necessarily know uniformly what to expect from a chiropractor that that doesn't mean that chiropractic hasn't been successful but mostly in Canada, the US, the UK, and parts of the European Union, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, where are where the schools of chiropractic are, and therefore uh, political influence as well to make chiropractic more reputable, I suppose. And in those jurisdictions, uh, chiropractic has uh, perhaps a more defined identity. Now, related to identity crisis, is number two, and what I call it mainstream messaging. And one could argue that that's, that is the same as 
um, identity crisis. And what I mean by that is various different organizations that represent chiropractic uh, across the world, including chiropractic colleges, present a little bit different and sometimes a lot different view of what chiropractic is. So therefore, again, a bit of an identity crisis. And then when, when it comes to uh, market share, uh, payers, insurers, uh, when there's a, an identity crisis and inconsistencies, they will define, the payers will define uh, who gets paid for what or whether they're actually referred to. So the third point there, again, being related to identity crisis is a sub point, perhaps. The third is public confusion, market confusion. So a confused market that doesn't know what a, a chiropractor does or pigeonholes a chiropractor to only deal with back pain doesn't know that I'm uh, chiropractors are very good with neck problems and, and most headaches. And that for the most part, we are, are practicing a primary care and, and have that primary care role model. However, it's different than the family physician. So I like that. And when we get into solutions, certainly I'd, I'd love to talk about that more. It has similarities with our, uh, many of our other colleagues here. The unique thing about chiropractic is I think the identity cr crisis. You know, number four is uh, not unique, but the perceived safety concerns of our primary treatment being spinal manipulation and joint manipulation. There's certainly been historically a huge negative bias against referral to chiropractic, to chiropractors by MDs and, and even insurance and providers. And that's been, there's, there's a, there are a whole bunch of issues behind that. But um, in, in general, there's been a huge negative bias. I, I see with the current uh, generations of practitioners and, and even the schools, um, medical schools perhaps, other schools being a little more fair to our profession and there's more evidence-based uh, practice. Uh, chiropractic is actually very evidence-based. And in fact, not just chiropractic, but spinal manipulation done by uh, chiropractors do the majority of spinal manipulation in the world. We're the most qualified to do spinal manipulation. There's no question that spinal manipulation helps for certain things like back pain, uh, headaches and, and certain evidence-based uh, practices. But we know from evidence-informed practice, which I want to talk about next, is, is guides a lot of our practices for all the commissioners here and you listening and watching is that we know that experience has a huge value in uh, who you see as a practitioner if you were to seek services for your own ailments. But what is that difference? And it is now being defined as evidence-informed practice. So there's clear evidence, but there's experience that guides the, the clinician, the practitioner, to actually uh, guide our care and still fall within evidence-based clinical guidelines. But the, the, there's, a, there's a balance. There's a, there's a slight, uh, well, a subtle balance between what's totally evidence-based, which would say, you know, the insurance companies love that because it's six visits and then you have to re-refer it out. We will no longer reimburse that. Now, who came up with those guidelines? Well, it was justified by this, you know, um, uh, popular research that showed this and this, and therefore we, our hands become tied, but the patient just wants to get better and they want to stay getting better. So my fifth point is chiropractic education and continuing education is, is a huge uh, continuum, but it's, it's a bit alarming for me when the balance is too much evidence-based and not enough evidence-informed practice. Um, that takes away the mastery of someone in practice, even for the difference between being in practice as a new graduate or someone being in practice for 10 years is a huge difference. Now, when we start getting into thousands and thousands and thousands of people that we've cared for and helped, we can't help them all, but that certainly gets into evidence-informed practice. And that's why I love the business model and the, and the, the teaching of and coaching for 
uh, especially younger practitioners of or of all ages that need that business practice um, and success in mentorship and coaching to help them be successful. So a uh, quick summary, identity crisis, having three points of the messaging, public confusion as to what chiropractic is, perceived safety. Uh, chiropractic is actually very, very safe when practiced by chiropractors uh, that are prudent and keeping their continuing education. And then number five is the chiropractic education and the continuing education. So that's, that's my quick summary of the concerns. Dr. Shaw, back to you. Wonderful. Yes, uh, we love our uh, chiropractic colleagues. Uh, uh, all doctors are as important as the next. We, uh, as you know, live similar lives and go undergo similar training and education based on the scientific method. Um, thank you for that presentation, Dr. Chong. And uh, now we will turn into something that's very important to all of us, which is uh, the philosophy of medicine and healthcare. Why are we here? Um, Dr. Ora and Boris, um, please uh, let us know a little bit uh, more about your profession. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Dr. Letran, for inviting me. Thank you so much to all the Hex Commission colleagues. Totally appreciated being in your presence. Well, um, I think we've gone for full circle. So we're coming back to what education is all about. And let's talk a little bit about two ideas. Um, as Mark Twain said, I never let schooling interfere with my education. There are two different issues there. Um, I've been trained in Romania. I went to school, I got my bachelor, my master, and my PhD. And I also went to school here at UCLA. Um, I've been exposed to two different educational systems. And so when we are talking about a certain profession, probably would have to talk about how were we trained to get to that profession. Um, besides being a college professor and an awarded educator, I also got the so-called, um, let's say, entrepreneurial bug. I published two books. One is called Out of the Transylvania Night. It was an entry for the Pulitzer Prize, and it was endorsed by Nadia Comaneci, the Olympic gold medalist. And the second book actually just came out. It's called Conversations with the Past. And it's a self-help motivational book. And that one was um, a finalist for the 2020 Best Book Awards. And I started also a magazine called See Beyond Magazine, but also we are going to talk a little bit more in the second part about the magazine that all of us are going to be part of, which is actually called the Top 100 Doctors. So let's talk a little bit about the philosophy of education. Let's really, really go back in time. I think that all of us remember when we went to high school, right? So we were exposed to a very limited curriculum. All of a sudden you're given six subjects, English, math, science, social science, and then you had foreign languages, maybe PE, maybe cooking, or maybe drama. So you were to decide, you were supposed to decide the future, your future career based on four subjects, English, math, social science, and science. So we have a lack of curriculum when it's coming down to prepare our future generation. In Europe, I was exposed to 15 different subjects that have given me the background to really know what do I want to accomplish? Where do I want to go? What do I want to prepare myself for? So first problem that I can see, it's a lack in our curriculum. It's how we are going to deliver that, how we are going to prepare actually the future generations of doctors if we are not really going to expose them to what that profession is going to be all about. Second issue, I would say there is really no hands-on exposure. We are really, really missing you know, the technology. When we're looking at COVID, all of a sudden, the whole instruction has moved on Zoom. People were not trained. We didn't really know how to conduct, you know, classes on Zoom and Canvas and Flipgrid and uh, so many other platforms that were created. And if you really believe that your students knew, they know how to approach social media. 
they don't really know what the real platforms for education are all about. So that problem is pretty much we have high demands with limited sources, but we are asking them to go in the world and they have to really have a high GPA. They have to have a teacher recommendation. They have to have college essays. They have to have really high scores for SAT. And then also the school they are graduating from, it has to have a very high API. And if you're not familiar with that, that's the academic performance index of each and every school. So pretty much, you know, your A, actually it's an A, it's not a C, because we are coming from an underperforming, you know, a school or, you know, middle school. Um, that's taking me to what my colleagues have already mentioned, tuition. Tuition has gone up, I would say skyrocketed. Um, private four-year schools, private, the tuition went up 25% in the last decade. Four-year public schools, tuition went up 35%. So let me give you the numbers here. The national student loan debt reached 1.6 trillion in June 2019, according to the Federal Reserve. Soaring college cost and pressure to compete in the job market are actually the biggest factors when it's coming down to students' loan debts. Very many of them are going to borrow and then they're not going to complete their education. So they are most likely going to default on their borrowing system as well. Then, you know, number four, and it was already mentioned, I would say it's the mental health problem. Uh, this is even before COVID has hit us. Um, anxiety, depression, you know, it's an overwhelming problem. When we're looking at two different drugs that are actually going to be given to our students, to our kids, Ambient and Ativan. Let me tell you from a marketing perspective, both are starting with letter A. Okay, so they're very, very highly recommended. What did we do wrong that we have lost this new generation that's supposed to be the generation of doctors and educators? You know, they are supposed to be mentally healthy. They have issues with self-esteem. They have issues with confidence. And they're really, really lost when it's coming down. What are they going to do? What kind of road are they going to take? And last but not least was already mentioned, I would say branding, exposure. We're all like isolated islands. We have to come together and form a group, a cohesive group, no matter what your specialty is all about and that's why i'm so thankful for dr you know to dr shaw and dr emily letran and to you guys you know for bringing us together because i really believe that each and every one of us can be really really good in his own space the problem is like how are we going to help each other out how are we going to support how are we going to inspire everybody else and that's only going to be done not by staying in your own office not by staying in your own classroom but actually coming together as a unit the way we're doing right now and inspire all of us and learn from our mistakes that have come from our own specialty but not only so Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm going to give the floor back to Dr. Shaw. Fantastic. Wow. Um, how exciting. The next thing, uh, I'm just sitting back here and listening to all of our colleagues present their uh, case. And uh, it's fascinating how much we have uh, uh, in, com in common and how little we have done to resolve these problems. You know, perhaps it would be a good idea to go around the table starting with medicine and just take a minute or two and explain uh, what commonality you saw uh, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll talk some solutions and some uh, uh, potential um, actions call to actions dr uh, morris what's your take on the matter oh wow so far so good i am loving everything i'm hearing um uh to touch back on dr embarros while you were speaking something came to mind um, we have to think of professional isolation as leading to stagnation. And I think that's what's happening. So we, we're stuck in our own little bubbles and not thinking about, okay, how am I going to grow as a professional? 
Uh, and, and, and I think you made some really cool points there, like, and I think Dr. Latran also touched on some of that too. So some solutions I think that we can do right the bat is education with regards to our own profession. I mean, start from young while, while we're still in training, you know, pre-med or, you know, or even doing bachelors where we, we, we train our, we teach the new generation that yes, get your career, but you have to be able to function as a business if you need to. You have to be able to understand the way the world works. And I think a lot of what we're seeing now with the educational system and to, your, and, and to speak to your, your model again, Dr. Mbaros, I was trained in the Caribbean. So, uh, and it's fun, you're right. We were exposed, we have the British model of, or, or the European model of teaching. We were exposed to a ton of different uh, um, um, subjects all through high school. You know, so we were able to to make certain certain decisions, and 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 I think that actually helped me to get to where I am. But my kids are growing up here in the U.S., and they are kind of pigeonholed into into some of the the the, the way. Depending on the state you live in, the education system has to be presented, and and that can hurt them in the future because not everyone learns the same way. We've seen that each child is different. You know, so so I think we need to definitely one attack from a young age those of us who are. Are, are, are in the pre part of our careers to be able to understand and function as a proper business that once we graduate and are in the real world. Um, with regards to the bureaucracy of medicine, I think we have to have a long discussion with each other and come together just like we do here to make huge changes for our own industry, for the industry of, 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 of healthcare, for doctors by and large. I mean, like Dr. Shah had mentioned in the beginning, once we come together, we, we are unstoppable. You know, and, and we need to be able to, to harness that, that, that fire and be able to move forward. And, and that, once we can do that, will lead to more camaraderie, will lead to, 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 to the fostering of new ideas, the fostering of new groups. You know, I mean, uh, take for example, if you're, like, if, me, if you're like me and you're in training in a residency program and you realize two of us are going into primary care, two of us are going into GI and two of us are going into cardiology, why not form a group? The patients will need each one of us. Stop fighting and let's just form a group, six doctors. You have more buy, more buying power. You have more clout, so to speak, professional clout when you approach certain organizations and say, well, we're six doctors. Collectively, we take care of 300,000 patients, you know, whether it's through referrals or whatever, whatever it is, or, or we're a group and we take care of this much number. Here's what we need to be able to practice medicine the way the patients deserve. And we can actually uh, can, 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 can make huge waves. So these are a couple of things that I was able to pick out, but I, I definitely want all of us to think of this professional um, isolation leads to stagnation. And that's why I think a lot of us are in our careers right now. This clock in, clock out. And that's not good. I yield back to Dr. Shah. That was wonderful. Uh, to add a comment um, about the new generation, business is half of the equation in medicine and healthcare. If a doctor does not wish to oversee it, perhaps medicine and healthcare is not for that particular doctor. Uh, and, and like you said, if a fraction of us come together, nothing can stop us, a fraction, small fraction. Uh, you know, these third parties coming in with, the, with all sorts of excuses, we relieve daily bureaucracy so you can focus on medicine, we increase access, of, access to healthcare. Please be very vigilant about those claims because they're not accurate. Their response to these organizations should be, we will allow you to provide services to us a la carte. Tell us what you provide and how you're gonna provide it and we'll pay you for it. But don't take ownership, don't steal our equity, don't come into our own home, tell us how we need to run our home. Um, so these are very important. So be very vigilant with the third parties. With that said, Dr. Gerald, great uh, uh, commonalities. Dr. Latron, uh, on dentistry, did you pick up anything from the other five uh, HEX members? Oh, yes. Um, I think the even though we think we're different, we're very, very similar. Um, I think everybody knows that uh, we collectively have let a third party kind of creep into our lives. Um, insurance dictating anything from outpatient visit all the way to obviously the, the surgery room. And um, I think we need to address that loss of control, uh, which I think we, we've heard that across the board from the very beginning where, where, where Dr. Embarras say, uh, you know, in school, the schools are not equipped to deal with certain things and the, the school may not be exposing our, our students to 
uh, certain ideas. The, the philosophy of teaching is sometimes uh, regulated by, let's just say, third parties, a government or donors, you know, or whichever, depending on which institution you go to, right? So we lose the control from there. And then when we go into practice, unless we are paying attention, unless we stay as a, um, as a continuous student, uh, we lose the control of our practice to, uh, to, to the third parties. And um, uh, I wanna touch on what Dr. Alan Chong said, um, the, the, the consumer confusion. Um, they're, not, they're not understanding uh, chiropractic. Well, it, it's the same thing as a dental patient, right? Uh, getting confused. Why do I need an implant? Why can't I just have a bridge? Why don't, you know, why don't you just take out all my teeth? Why do I have to fix my teeth? And, and that talks about the common thing that there's a lack of patient education. That I mean, we are well educated, but for some reason, we, we sounds like we are missing it a little bit there in, in explaining to our patient what's most important to them. It's not the easiest way right now, um, unless that's the only thing you could do. But think about their health, their overall health, not just the dental health, or the back health, or you know the gut health. Think of that as as, as um, taking care of their whole body and um, and keeping you know us healthy as a community, uh, co including even mental health. So those are those are some of my thoughts. I think we 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 the discussion um, uh, just show a lot of commonalities and 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 hopefully the solution will will solve them all. Dr. Shah. Thank you so much. That was a lovely uh, a rebuttal there on the, on, the, on the concepts. You mentioned that uh, the schools, the schools are, uh, tend to be what I've noticed uh, uh, many, many light years uh, behind. We need to move with modern times and utilize the latest technologies and our colleagues to our advantage in, in coming together. Autonomy is extremely important. Consumer confusion, uh, we need to educate the patients and public education is very important. We have a legal contract, a legal and a moral contract with patients to serve in their best interest. We do not have this agreement with third parties. They need to understand that. And uh, uh, when we make decisions, we make decisions based on the agreement that we have with patients, not with third parties. Thank you so much, Dr. Tran, Dr. John Kryak uh, on the matter of pharmacy. Thank you, Kianor. So. Uh, uh, Dr. Morris and Dr. Latron have um, touched on some uh, very important issues that were not only relevant in dentistry and medicine, but also to pharmacy. Um, so instead of going over and, you know, um, elaborating on what they said, I want to focus on one thing that I kind of uh, mentioned before, and that is um, communication um, between all of the clinicians. Uh, right now, um, even, for example, on this, um, uh, on this webinar, we've got people from um, various backgrounds and various professions. And having a little bit of communication um, with having a focus on the overall outcomes um, for that uh, patient um, is going to be essential. Um, it's not about whether I'm right and you're wrong, um, but it's a matter of what can we do for that patient in front of us. And I think that that is something that, you know, as we begin to move forward and um, as this group begins to grow and more professionals come in, you know, it's, it's something that um, can even be resonated within the programs um, uh, where we learn. Um, you know, in, um, in pharmacy school, um, you know, learned about, oh, working with the doctors and working with the nurses. But in practice, that's, you know, uh, I'm seeing an increase of it, but there's still um, with the inner profession between doctor to doctor or nurse to nurse or, you know, whatever, where there might be some um, uh, people trying to prove their point or show that they're right. But I think that if we all work together um, uh, and communicate, I think that that is uh, uh, one of the primary areas, in addition to the two that were already mentioned by Dr. Latrine and Dr. Morris. So I'm going to turn this back to uh, Kinor. Thank you. One of the most important topics that was just touched up on was uh, collaboration versus competition. All of our KOLs in our industry that work for themselves and that promote themselves, they uh, are not nearly as successful as our colleagues that collaborate with everyone around them. Um, it's a system and the system operates best if you have a sh efficiency and effect, uh, effectiveness on how you 
conduct yourself. So yes, the person down the street, you know, there's a saying that your your best friend, uh, your best dental friend is uh, 50 plus miles away uh, from your uh, practice location. That's not the case. The guy down the street is my friend, is my colleague, is a person that uh, understands uh, what I'm doing. So if you collaborate, um, you're in a much better place than we can be. There's so much work out there. The world is doesn't have enough doctors, okay? So we, we are not really, there's plenty to go around for everybody. So if you use uh, this reset in, in the world with this pandemic uh, to create a new system where collaboration supersedes competition, we will prevail. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Royer. Give us the vision of uh, uh, the profession of optometry. Great presentation, please proceed. Uh, so many commonalities uh, that I see between the, the different fields. Um, Dr. Karak um, really touched on, you know, the drug interaction. Um, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the push to move all of medicine um, to EHR programs was the design to, for all of them to communicate, and that failed drastically. Um, it it is um, it's it's sad that uh, it was great effort, but we we need to fix that part. Um, Dr. Morris and Dr. Latran, uh, they touched on the the issues with practice management and um, running the business side of things. Um, significant issue there in in optometry. Uh, although there are a few schools that have uh, have made advancements in in that area, uh, but still much to be done. Um, Let's see, Dr. Uh, Latran uh, mentioned the insurance, uh, definitely a huge problem um, with the dental insurance side of things, same with the, with the vision insurance. Um, and uh, a number of you put, mentioned uh, patient education. Um, there, it's so important to get compliance from a patient for them to understand their, their disease, uh, how to fix that disease, uh, how to better their quality of life. Uh, patient education uh, is extremely important. And, um, and then um, Dr. Um, Kong mentioned um, education of the profession to, and their benefits to the medical community and the general population. Um, optometry needs to do a better job uh, as well there. And uh, explaining and, and just explain ourselves and um, letting, uh, although we've made great strides in the last uh, 10, 15 years, um, there's more to be done there uh, on our end. And uh, very important, I, I see that. I've got a lot of chiropractic friends. Um, uh, my wife went to chiropractic school as well. And just the, the problems that, that they face, um, the education that they have is phenomenal. Um, but, you know, un unfortunately they are, um, misrepresented, um, no, not misrepresented, misunderstood is a better term. So, um, that's what I have and, uh, I'll send it back to you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you very much. You raised the point of maximizing communication, utilizing, uh, currently we have technological tools, uh, uh, available to us to do things that we have never been able to do in history. Um, experience as you know, trumps all. Uh, you may agree, you may not agree, but if we use our senior colleagues as a stepping stone to the career that we want to build, it's a lot more effective associating with senior colleagues than uh, joining the, the corporate uh, uh, outfits. Um, pharmacy, based on solid evidence, and I agree with you, Dr. Royer, uh, versus big pharma's narrative is always important to preserve uh, humanity. Uh, 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 the, the humane part of, of, of being a doctor, the benevolence, the autonomy. So we need to be very vigilant with these companies and their products and what they do to have doctors promote them. Um, it looks bad on us uh, at the end of the day, uh, not them. Um, thank you for uh, that, uh, that uh, observation and the commonalities. And now we lead into chiropractic, Dr. Chong. Uh, what did you see uh, or learn from the Hex members? Uh, 
Well, ex excellent dialogue is what I say. And, and the, the theme that I observed was that we all have frustrations about uh, how do we get back to as, as a world, as a country, as a state, as a province, as a jurisdiction back to uh, patient centered care. Because let's think about it. if there's zero patients, there are we wouldn't be in business, would we? Whether we're, we work for another organization or we work for ourselves in private practice. Now that's a ridiculous thing to think about. There's always patients. And in fact, there's a growing uh, educated patient base out there. They are more particular, but they are locked. They're more educated than ever. Anywhere in the world, we have a more, much more educated patient base. Now, do the establishments and the, the does Big Pharma and, and do other uh, HMOs, et cetera, are they maybe a little bit concerned about that? Well, they're thinking already 10 steps ahead how to still to make money and to cut costs. So that's a huge frustration that I think we've all, all shared. So my big uh, solution it would be to put in strategies and in, in insist upon patient care. Like Dr. Uh, Kriak, said, you know, I am so frustrated every single day, people that are inappropriately medicated, but it's not within my scope of practice really to comment on that because I could lose my license for that actually. So there, there's these hierarchies that are established. And I just say, go back to the pharmacist and ask, is that an appropriate, you know, uh, that you're taking three anti-inflammatories, right? For example. So, uh, you know, there needs to be gates and gatekeepers that are appropriate, not government and third party payers that determine what, what uh, you know, where healthcare is going. So I think from a leadership standpoint, Dr. Shaw, um, Global Summit Institute is taking huge leadership worldwide to not only get that message out, but to have these dialogues, the HEX Commission is a great start to influence others to get mobilized, other doctors around the world to get mobilized to uh, band together really where there's power and insist on change at the uh, bureaucratic level, at the funding level and, and at the rollout level. Wow. That's what I have to say. Lovely. This is a wonderful discussion. You know, you brought up the issue of governments. Governments can provide solutions to our problems. Even if uh, public servants and politicians are sincere about their efforts, they don't understand this industry to be able to, uh, uh, to set policy. Uh, policy should emanate from a, a body of doctors. We are um, a lot smarter than these third parties. We have better work ethics. Um, we are um, actually respected by the public and we can make a change. Um, so in terms of patient-centered care, this is a very good point. If there were zero patients, there would be no healthcare industry. If there were zero doctors, there would be no healthcare industry. But if there were, for instance, zero insurance companies, we would still have a healthcare industry. Um, did you know that uh, insurance started in some uh, grocery store uh, and now they're to a point in their, uh, uh, in their uh, games that uh, they're almost about to overwhelm their hosts. So we will discuss some solutions in that regard as all members are in agreement that we have a big problem there. Um, with that said, a little bit of uh, philosophy on the matter, Dr. Embaris. Thank you so much. Well, I think that all of you guys, thank you so much for you know bringing to the table the commonalities. Um, what I've seen, there are two things that kind of like stood out on top of whatever was discussed. I think the business flavor of our private businesses uh, and private practices is missing. And I think that's why, you know, coming together to a common denominator actually is going to help each and every one of us out. And then um, in order for us to be supportive of each other and cohesive, I think we have to change a mindset. You know, I have to look at all of you guys as not my competition, but my cooperation. And I think that's kind of like bringing us to a quote that I really, really like, and I'm going to actually end my statement with that particular quote that was said by Alexander Dumas in The Three Musketeers that said, all for one and one for all, united we stand, divided we fall. 
Wonderful. That's funny that you mentioned that because on our crest, uh, uh, the doctor, the doctor concept uh, underneath it and uh, Greek uh, and in Latin says unitas stomus, which is united we stands and in Greek uh, divided we fall below it. Um, thank you, Dr. Embaris. Now uh, I would like to take this opportunity to open the floor to discuss some solutions. Uh, as you guys may or may not know, um, we uh, spend the last seven years of organizing um, the projects and infrastructure for uh, academic, administrative, and, uh, and uh, financial uh, uh, three-prong approach to the problem. And as a consequence, um, we uh, had multiple projects and global summits that led to the Global Interdisciplinary Summit in 2020, uh, where at the height of COVID, we brought in um, experts uh, and speakers, uh, doctor colleagues from 72 countries that presented on uh, the entire spectrum in terms of education that our colleagues tuned into quality care education, where we exchange a lot of ideas and so forth. But now we are duplicating and expanding that into all of the healthcare industry. So let's talk some plausible, sustainable solutions uh, as to the, the most common issues that have been raised, which was A, um, supporting the younger generation, insurance, uh, excessive regulation, um, and all of those topics that we have discussed. Um, Let's uh, start with Dr. Latron, who was uh, very big on uh, on uh, the idea of collaboration, patient education. What are your some thoughts? You've been around now for, I believe, uh, since 2014 or so, Dr. Latron, and you have seen us grow into uh, different verticals. What are you, some of your thoughts about the 20 plus projects that we have now under the doctor to doctor uh, flag? Um, what are your thoughts there? How do you see we have succeeded? What did we do differently? Well, thank you so much. Um, I, um, I think the world can only exist in collaboration if you wanna go for long-term. And uh, thank you so much for being a visionary. I know it's been um, a big part of your work and um, I joined in a little bit later, but I can see uh, the momentum that we have built up and now we actually have some concrete programs and platforms um, that we have created to bring the doctors together. And I'm gonna invite Dr. Uh, Aura Embaras to, to speak right after me. Uh, the thing is we, for example, as far as platforms, we have the Global Summit. We have the Podinars where we have invited so many doctors from different disciplines to come up and share, right? So all the world unite uh, every Saturday and Sunday, <laughs> you know, midnight in India. <laughs> and, um, and it's amazing to have 300 groups, Facebook groups being shared uh, during the one hour. And I, I think that's, that is collaboration. Um, you, you may not know who's listening to you. You may not know who's appreciating you, but, but you know that you have the platform to share that. And I think that's really, really big on, um, you know, to, to, to have a voice. If you wanna, if you wanna address government or, or, or insurance, and if you have a voice to address that, uh, it's huge. And sometimes they're not gonna let you on the platform, right? Because it's their platform. So we have created our own platform. You, ha you hold um, the Academy of Oral Surgery. You're training surgical procedures to a lot of GPs. Uh, you put on the global summits where you got different speakers come in from all over the world. And now we're getting to the, the, the stage um, of now we're creating a magazine where that is our platform. We, I don't want to say we can say whatever, because I'm sure Dr. Auer is, <laughs> is, is going to have some kind of control over that. But you can share your story. You can inspire others. You can make it your own thing. And, and, and and make it where you know other doctors can freely share and understand each other. And I think that's huge because whenever you have a platform, your voice just got a little stronger. You gotta be an authority to have your own platform, right? And, and it's, it's, uh, it, we, we are blessed to just kind of plug into to a, a platform that she already has. She's gonna create one just for us and it's just, just for our professionals to, to, um, to have our voice to 
to let other people know, to let the insurance industry know. You can write an article in there, tell the insurance industry how you really feel, right? And just have them share with their friends and, and, and they can come back to the table and talk to us. So, Dr. Aurora? Thank you, Dr. Latran. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Latran, for bringing me on board. Um, I've been in the educational field for many years, 22 years, but also I've been um, working in the media. So um, I was a journalist in Europe. Um, I was part of uh, Radio Contact, which is a radio station that is very known. Um, I, um, I was part of the National Journal, which was in Romania, you know, one branch in Transylvania, where I'm coming from. Um, and then here, I pretty much interviewed celebrities on the red carpet in different areas and then pretty much in 2015 the idea of starting a magazine to serve students and to motivate them and to really give them the voice that they couldn't really find um was started in 2016 and it's called see beyond magazine so um having uh dr letran on the cover of my magazine we started you know sharing ideas and then Dr. Shaw came and you know proposed so the idea that to create a platform, like you said, that is going to represent doctors, but not only. And so I'm just going to read to you pretty much what this you know new magazine that we're starting right now it's going to be all about. So it's a niche magazine presenting world recognized doctors, dentists, and specialists who promote excellence, innovation, research organizational leadership and an elevated entrepreneurial spirit in serving the healthcare industry. Top 100 Doctors magazine launches a new movement for those with the expertise, limitless potential, and the desire to share ideas with the world. Doctors encourage solidarity among healthcare professionals through direct peer-to-peer -peer transparent mechanics and systems. So we actually came up with a couple of uh, columns or sections. And so the very first one is called Doctor to Doctor, that it's presenting solid advice from one expert to another in the world of medicine and dentistry, in addition to the latest discoveries and cutting edge technology that informs healthcare professionals. We have business to business, introducing professionals to successful entrepreneurship and highly acclaimed business models. We have soul to soul, inspiring people with stories of uh, enlightenment, education, family, relationships, happiness, intentional living, life issues, spiritual growth, social justice, health and fitness. And then we have the last category, leadership exploring what defines this new generation of healthcare professionals and their legacy. And like Dr. Latron and Dr. Shah said, pretty much we are going under the vision of learn one, do one, teach one. Mm. How lovely is that? Um, uh, and uh, the magazine will be issued on uh, March 15. It's a lead leadership magazine. It's not about being superior by any means. Um, when we did the world's top 100 doctors in dentistry in 2020 and 2021, two different classes of 100 doctors, they're all innovators, educators, clinicians, uh, researchers. And it was about uh, bringing people in, in areas of, uh, of authority to a table that can help uh, perpetuate the agenda. So, uh, and what Dr. Latron referred to, what a podinar is, it's a podcast plus a webinar that we have actually coined the term some time back and we bring doctors to tell a little bit about their story for maybe the first segment of the show and then it goes into a scientific scenario where we can all learn from their experiences and expertise be it clinical or be it uh, administrative or be it financial any of those uh, uh, three uh, in the three-prong approach so we encourage you guys all to reach out to the doctors that you see on the screen here their information will be posted to these links to the major link where you can contact them if you're a doctor that has ideas or you're excelling in a certain procedure or a certain technology, you might want to reach out to doctor to the doctors here that will be uh, uh, guiding uh, uh, those podinars that will be hosting those podinars, which uh, the podinars season starts on May one. Um, thank you so much. So, Dr. Morris, uh, from the medical perspective, 
Yes. I've been after you guys the most because, uh, you know, you guys have the lion's share and you guys have fought and fought and fought and uh, the money uh, overwhelmed you guys. Are we going to fix this? Well, I mean, yeah, we fought and fought, uh, but by and large, we are still a bit disjointed as a as a as a as a as an overall community. So I'm hoping that with the events of 2020, as we move into 2021, and with the help of my colleagues here on this panel, that we can definitely begin to make some real change. You know, I mean, I'm part of many Facebook groups where physicians are 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 running and. We do a lot of talking amongst ourselves in terms of, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that. But I mean, only a few of us are, uh, are wanting to just step out and make and, 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 and kind of force the change that we know we need in order for us to survive within our practice lives. So I think, I think it's, it's gonna take baby steps because uh, by and large physicians are, 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 are typically hard headed. <laughs> so, so I think if we, can, uh, if we can definitely show them, you know, more and more of what's available to them out there, especially when it comes to uh, practicing on their terms, I think we'll see we'll see some major progress. I, I want to give you an example. A buddy of mine who was practicing on the West Coast, who is so he is on the West Coast actually. He was part of a large hospital group, whatever, uh, like a like a one of those big healthcare organizations, and uh, they were paying him X. Okay, so it was it was the typical you know outpatient salary, you know, and and then. Um, and then they kept pressuring him to see more and see more and see more patients. And mind you, he is a family practice, you know, a, a well-liked, and he was averaging anywhere from uh, last time I spoke to him, 20 to 22 patients a day, in addition to managing or helping manage other patients of others in his team. And, uh, and he was a good producer. I mean, he was, he was definitely bringing in the money, but I mean, they kept telling him, hey, we need more from you, we need more. And he worked eight to five, five days a week, you know, an, an employed position. And I think one day he 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 had a he emailed he emailed a, it looks like one of the heads up and said hey you know what I just want to take a look at my numbers to see exactly you know what am I bringing in you know if you're saying I need to bring more I must be lacking somewhere and it I, I, from when I talked to him I think it was by accident they sent him the wrong spreadsheet and the spreadsheet he got gave him his his actual numbers of production for the first quarter of the year that he was working there and I kid you not. Because he actually called me because he was stunned. He had already, in the first three months, he had already brought in, in effect, in excess of $1.5 to $1.6 million. Just his production alone. He had brought that in. And mind you, his salary is a mere fraction. He was getting the typical $140,000 a year as an outpatient doc. And, and seeing that blew his mind. Because then in his, in his mind, okay, how much more can I produce? if we haven't gotten to the half of the year yet and I'm bringing this much. So he took it upon himself to resign from that position, opened up his own, his own practice and now he is living the life that he, that he wants to live, his practice life. And I think that's the, that's the shade, that's the, that's the green curtain that a lot of us don't get to see when you go into these employed positions. It's painted, oh, you know what? We'll take care of everything. You just see the patients. And, that's, and, that, and, I, and I'll be honest, I was part of that too before I went into private practice. And you don't realize the, how much you bring into an organization until you take a look at the numbers. And a lot of big organizations will not give you the numbers because they know once you see the numbers, you become informed. And when you become informed, you begin to realize, okay, this is what's my, what's my worth here to the organization. If in one year I can bring in 6 million, but you're only paying me 150,000 and begrudgingly give me a bonus every, at the end of every year, what am I doing here? I can do the same on my own. You know, and, 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 and reap the tax benefits too, because now I'm no longer W2, um, my own business. So there's a lot that we need to learn. And, uh, and it all starts with education. I think if we can drive it home to physicians that, hey, you are master and commander of the ship, whether you're a dentist, doctor, optometry, you run your own, you know, you know, chiropractic, you know, you run your own business. You know, this is what, this is how you can benefit from trying and being on your own. And, you, and when you're in, on your own, you're not really on your own. You have a collaborative around you. You have other doctors around you who are living the same and walking the same journey, walking the same path, who can provide, who can provide you with tons of information and, 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 and knowledge of do's and don'ts as you step out into the real world. So I think for medicine, we just need to, to kind of stand up and realize that we can make change and we can't do it on our own. So we will need the help of our colleagues who are already successful in business and charge forward into 2021.
So I look forward to seeing all the great things that the, 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 the next panel is going to, going to provide. And I'm glad to be a part of it. So, Doc, uh, my apologies. I had to laugh because that uh, contention that uh, uh, the companies, the story they tell our colleagues is, is, is just a plain joke. Um, as you know, um, uh, uh, for a percentage of the collection and a small benefits package to lose all of your equity makes no sense for anyone because that equity is what pays off your student lo loans if you need to sell your office or, or gets you your new house or your new car or you want to get married or you want to get into something else. They forget to mention that they take this equity and sell it to hedge funds for billions of dollars. Uh, retirement groups and hedge funds and then you can be somewhere in China or somewhere in Russia and own a practice in Europe or in America or some guy that has no clue what they're talking about in medicine and healthcare but uh, you said uh, we need to get started you know baby steps you mentioned lead to building grand things okay a journey of mm -hmm. a thousand miles must start with a single step correct so yes. we have to uh, duplicate the model that we know works and uh, and for the love of medicine and healthcare, and our futures and our uh, and our next generations, uh, it's incumbent upon us to act, and we will act. Um, thank you so much. Uh, with that, Dr. Um, Kryak, uh, some uh, solutions on your end for the healthcare industry. Absolutely. And so, you know, just to kind of um, expand upon a little bit what Dr. Morris had said, you know. Um, I've always been with the premise of the scoot, crawl, walk, run approach. And I mean, you know, I think with what we're doing here today is we are starting the scoot. You know, we are, we are coming together as a group um, and, you know, starting, starting at the bottom. And then as more people start to come in and as, you know, uh, many of the professionals and that, you know, all of that, you know, there will be a, um, essentially there, there will be a call to action. Uh, for everything that we've got there. And, you know, um, and it starts with us and, and everyone that is listening to this uh, pod nor right now. Um, together, we can definitely do this. Um, and, you know, um, our voices, the people that are treating the patients, the ones that are actually paying the insurance companies and funding the big pharma and doing all of those things, you know, our voices right now might be small, but they are going to get a lot louder. Yes, indeed. And uh, those that are funding the third parties, they um, ought to be concerned. Um, so, Dr. Chong, you know, talk is cheap. Action is, uh, action is uh, what counts. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, for example, we had one doctor on one of our shows uh, that discussed about uh, how to tackle the insurance monster. And, uh, uh, and send them back uh, uh, to wherever they came from to act a little bit more professional and consider this environment that they're in. Um, what is your thought about this lack of business education? What was our approach to start, uh, uh, start uh, complementing the lack of action taken by the professional schools across the world? Right. Well, well, Dr. Shaw, I think all of us on this commission realizes that that professional education is not business education. In fact, it's far from it. I can still remember 33 some odd years ago. I mean, they tried. They 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 told me to you know we all had to do a medical legal report. And we had to do a few things, but and and those are fundamental skills. However, we're talking about being successful. Two things I would say: your initiative to create a high-end program, which Dr. Latran is the dean of, is the Doctor of Healthcare Business (DHB), and that is a brilliant program for those who want to really uh, learn on a formal basis how how to run a business, whether you want to run a multidisciplinary, multiple clinics, or how to be a leader within your, your uh, profession or your city or your jurisdiction, or your town to become uh, not only, pay, for example, the fundamentals, pay down your debt in an organized fashion to, to be profitable, how to market, uh, how to brand. And, and my role in that is, is to do some business basics, which I'm very good at, like even negotiating leases and hire professionals to do that type of thing, but know how to hire the people to do the work that you need done, as opposed to just here blank check. So many doctors are, are great, uh, busy 
seeing patients and then therefore great at paying writing checks if you're in private practice. And that is not the, the, the formula for a successful business. So your uh, initiative, and now you, you probably have some announcements to make, I'm not sure if it's today, but the Doctor of Healthcare Business is an amazing program, which I'm happy to be participating in a small uh uh, in a small way to teach one of my expertises, uh, not only as a clinician, that's not going to be my role. My role is actually in, I'm very good at business and the entrepreneurial part of business. So that's my contribution to this doctor of healthcare business. So take it away. Wonderful. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, more can be found on drhb.org. Um, as you know, having well-informed doctors with a business mind, does not serve these parties well. Um, it's important that we uh, increase our business acumen, our uh, public speaking skills, our uh, local positioning in our communities as the authorities uh, versus uh, you know the chains. And, and Dr. Shaw, I do want to add for all the listeners and, and viewers out there, the, the most practical thing you can do is we are better together. If you believe that movement in, in healthcare, then it, it really is easy to reach out to uh, one or two uh, colleagues of yours and ask for help, ask for mentorship. You know, let's start connecting docs with docs at the very grassroots level. And those who want to take the doctor of healthcare business, then certainly that's, that's a, a next big step. And it's also a commitment. But I would encourage each one of you listening and watching to just reach out to one, two or three uh, you know, colleagues and, and share your mutual concerns and say, can we work together on this instead of competing? And they might be in different cities, still a lot of value in that. So that's my, my bit of uh, practical advice there. Senior mentorship, very important, Doc. Um, you have to understand that if we pass on from generation to generation without allowing them to infiltrate our, uh, our uh, industries, it will also be very beneficial. We don't always want to pick up all of the habits of the senior ones. Maybe they have some, 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 some. Find the goods and 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 ask three or four, and then make your own. And on and on we go in this perpetual cycle. Um, um, can can I add something real quick? Uh, yeah. And it's just exactly on what Dr. Chom just said. You know, the option of reaching out to a mentor or a, a senior um, colleague has always been there. Um, the challenge is sometimes we feel, oh, if I'm gonna ask this question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound stupid, right? Or maybe I should have learned this already. I should have known this already. And so the, 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 the doctor of healthcare, uh, doctorate of healthcare business, what we're trying to do is we wanna teach the mindset, right? Um, we wanna give everything in a systemized way so you can hit the ground running because, uh, for example, if you want to learn in dentistry, if you want to learn implants, you can go to a continuum, you can go to a course and you learn that specific thing. What if you sign up for Academy of Oral Surgery where, we, where you're going to learn all aspects of surgery? Because obviously surgery is one of the things that you want to learn. Um, so that's, that's kind of a difference there. And, and there's a commitment, but I don't know of anybody who is successful, who is not committed to whatever they're trying to do. So in this case, we want committed students to learn to close the gap between clinical excellence and business expertise so that we don't have uh, practitioners that when something like a, pand a pandemic hit, that they haven't been watching their numbers right? That they get depressed, they get stressed. Because hopefully if you're running your business well, making sound decisions based on numbers and have the right mindset, then it doesn't really matter. You're going to go and create your own economy. You're going to attract the, your own blue ocean kind of patients and you're going to survive and thrive in anything. So there's a little, there's a little bit of difference there. Um, it is a commitment. It is an ask. It is a little push. But unless you do that, you're not going to change. So that's well, my thoughts. Dr. Latron, on that point, um, when I was doing an MBA in international business, it was uh, all these things about finance and accounting and stuff that we didn't really need in a medical setting. Our program that we designed 
is based on the things that doctors actually need to succeed in the, in the supply chain of healthcare. Um, a little bit different, you know, combination programs exist, but nothing like this uh, uh, has ever been done. Um, and uh, it's a good start uh, because what we learned in business, what I took away from my MBA was in business, always take care of the other person's needs and your needs will be taken care of. If you take this approach, put money aside, people that know us know that we started these 20 plus projects, not because we were chasing money. Money is a means to an end, right? So money will come to those who take care of the business needs of others first. Take care of your communities, join the chambers, join the, uh, the different uh, uh, city hall meetings, go there, start establishing yourself as an authority in your local community. Challenge the, the, the public servants about healthcare and what they're doing in the different uh, cities. We are not just limited to what happens in North America. Socialized medicine has its problems with governments. The free markets have their problems with these corporations. Uh, ultimately, if we stick together, we have a solution for all of them. Um, okay, Dr. Reuter, uh, lay it on us. I'd just like to drive home the point that collaboration is key. Uh, learning from the success stories and the mistakes of, of, our, of our peers, our colleagues, um, that's an invaluable lesson that we can that we can put in into use in, in our own profession. And um, I love the idea of the doctor of healthcare business. Um, that program, uh, it, where's it been? <laughs> we, uh, uh, we've been needing that for a, a long time. So um, that's what I have. I'll throw it back to you, Dr. Can I, can I do Dr. Morris, please. Yeah, so um, with Dr. Royer's comment, I think uh, I, I love the idea of learning from others' mistakes and we kind of have to get out of our own insecurities because let's face it, we all have made mistakes in, in, in business, but being able to share it is a big step. And I think once we can do that, once you're open enough to do that, you'll also pick up something from the other person. So, so I think it, it, it's key for us to be able to, especially when you're reaching out to a mentor to ask uh, or someone you deem is successful based on how you see their practices growing. You know, the, you just want to make sure that you reach out. And, and if you're the one who they're reaching out to, I mean, don't be afraid. You really shouldn't be afraid. Uh, now is not the time to kind of hide the mistakes. You know, we have to be able to say, okay, I did this and this wrong and lost X. <laughs> so you don't want to do this and this. Okay. And, and, and with explanation, of course, uh, because I mean, the most successful groups are the ones that share the knowledge. I mean, and, and let's be, that's why the wealthy stay wealthy. They help each other out, you know, in the grand scheme of the world. You know, they, they make smarter decisions because they're able to help each other say, hey, you know what, don't invest in that. I did it last year, it didn't work out. So we as a group, you know, doctors, we have to, we need to be able to or begin to think like that and operate like that. You know, or Dr. Shaka, Dr. Morris, I wouldn't do that if I were you because in your market, I tried it and this is what happened. Now, then again, I take his advice with a grain of salt. I may say, you know what, let me give it a try or let me try this spin on it. And, and I think the, the DHB, the Doctor of Healthcare Business, is, is, is phenomenal. I mean, I've looked at the program and I'm actually a part of it. So I, I, I think anyone who is wanting for that freedom of, be, of being able to be truly be your own boss is something you should definitely look into it. I mean, it's, 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 it's going to change the world. You know, I wanted to add to it that the goodwill, Pete, the goodwill within us, you know, some of these doctors that came and donated um, hours of free quality, complimentary education to others, they did it out of the goodwill of their hearts. You know, some companies charge them five, 10, 15, 20 grand for a day to have their time. These guys came and donated their time. Nobody was chasing money. People have that in them, our colleagues do. So when you go out or whoever is watching this, if you have something to offer for the benefit of patients and doctors, the Global Summits Institute will back it up. The Hex Commission will back it up. Bring it to us. Let's synchronize. Let's get on the same page. Let's bring these ideas. Ideas are the most powerful thing. Not money, not uh, titles, not, uh, you know, what have you. Um, at the end of the day, a powerful idea can change the way things are. And uh, we can achieve that as doctors. We have the, we have the stamina. So, um, with that said, guys, uh, I'm starting to head towards final comments. 
Is there anything that you guys would, uh, let's uh, go around a circle and one final thought uh, from everybody. Uh, uh, mine is very simple. Our doors are open to doctors across the world. We have demonstrated the pilot in dentistry. It has succeeded to the tunes of millions. Um, we intend to uh, uh, expand it into all of the healthcare industries. We remain here for you, with you, and uh, uh, come to us and uh, take that first step and let's make a, a tremendous impact for the, for the patients and for the doctors and for the healthcare industry. Dr. Chong. Uh, I, I would say, f for one, thank you very much for, for having the vision and continuing to have the vision. And to really, I see this more as an overall global movement, uh, Global Summit Institute. And is that where, where you would like people to, to you know, sign on to or, or like? or what, what's, your, what's your best call to action? I want our audience to know that for sure. Where do, you, do they go? So there's only one global summit on, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and the others. And uh, we are going to start alternating just the dental lectures with pharmacy, optometry, medicine, chiropractic, and philosophy, where experts uh, from across the spectrum come and present, and we can all look in. Uh, topics that interest you, it's an open source. There's no registrations, and there's no barriers to education. You're, uh, you come in on the scheduled date on the weekends where we get the biggest exposures across the world between the hours of 7 a.m. and 12 Pacific time, which hits Asia and Europe very well. We conduct these uh, uh, sessions. Soon there'll be sessions in pharmacy, optometry, medicine, and chiropractic. We have done a couple of those. That happens on the weekends. It's free of charge. We bring ideas to Hex Commission members or Dream Team members. There's a, a very large group of 250 plus doctors working on these projects for, from the goodwill of their hearts. Bring us ideas, bring us your plans. We will implement them and back them one way or another, uh, as long as they benefit doctors and they benefit patients. Excellent, on to, on to the next. <laughs> Dr. Morris. Uh, I just want to tell my medical colleagues who are watching to have an open mind. Uh, I know things may have been rough last year, 2020, but I think moving forward, we do need to have an open mind and, 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 and take in these new ideas, these things that could are game changing for our industry. Um, I believe it's so. And um, following Dr. Shah and Dr. Latran with, with what they're trying to put together here, amazing. I think this could be a real, real game changer and kind of give us back the profession of medicine, you know, give it back to us. Let us be able to take care of patients the way we were trained to and the way we really, really need to. Back to you, Shah. Thank you, um, Dr. Kryak. Yeah, so, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, um, thank you to uh, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Latron for uh, organizing this. Um, and for everyone out there, uh, just realize, hey, um, you know, that you're not alone. Um, I know, uh, I would find it hard to believe that there are not um, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of clinicians that are out there that are undergoing the many of the same issues that we discussed today. Um, uh, we are here, uh, we are small now, but we are growing. So, uh, you know, as Dr. Shaw had said, you know, bring, uh, bring things to us, you know, um, uh, give us your thoughts, your ideas, and uh, together we can move this forward. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Cryak. Um, uh, Dr. Royer? Um, I would like to say to, uh, to everyone watching, uh, specifically any of the optometric uh, colleagues that we have, um, your voice should be heard. If you have something that you feel uh, you'd like to, um, to bring to the table, any ideas, um, we're open. Um, Open-minded, bring them on. We, uh, we'd love to, uh, to entertain uh, those ideas. And uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Shaw. Uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, participate. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Latron. It, um, it's always my honor to be part of a panel and to share my thoughts and ideas. I would say it's a new year. Um, be the new you. Embrace change. I, uh, we had a little party now this morning and I say, you got to shrink your butt, right? B-U-T, right? Uh, I want to do this, but I don't have this. 
I want, I want to do this, but I don't have time. I want to do this, but I don't know how. We are providing the platform. Um, we are providing some expertise. Uh, reach out to us. I would say the call to action would be to like uh, Global Summit's page uh, to make sure. I think there's a notification when something's going on. You get notified. You check in. You can reach out and talk to any one of us. And uh, we got those platforms like the new magazine that you can write, you can share your thoughts. Uh, we got the new program for training. If you're, if you're ready for that, and, and I'm gonna just say it right here, if you wanna do it and, and, and you're not sure about your time, we're making it very easy in segments of six weeks. If you're thinking about the financial aspect, we, we have the financing companies who can help you with that. It's just like anything that you're gonna be investing in higher education. There's a commitment, there's an investment, and I would I invite you to invest in yourself and your business in this new year. United we shall stand, Dr. Mbaras. Well, it is a new year, right? So I think that a rise, it's always going to happen after a fall. And we are here pretty much, you know, top 100 magazine. It's here not only to listen to your stories, to really promote your products and really support your businesses. So join us, now it's the time. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Global Summits Institute, uh, its regions, its chairs, its ambassadors, uh, we'd like to thank you for your time uh, of uh, two hours today to come to the table. Um, as doctors, we are a very accurate uh, kind of people. We work, uh, based on small measures and on some time. I'm looking on the clock. We are a few minutes away from the two hour mark line because uh, that's what we do. We do things with surgical precision. Um, we'd like to uh, make some final notes uh, as to our next upcoming meeting. The next public meeting will commence on March 21, 2021. And that's the first day of uh, spring, as you may know. Um, and uh, we shall report back on progress on new projects that have developed out of the uh, mutual combined efforts of the noble professions. Please tune in. Meanwhile, we highly encourage you to either consider presenting on a podinar, which is uh, complimentary to the audience um, on a given weekend, reach out to the uh, applicable commissioner who can set that up uh, with the appropriate host, which rotates. And let's begin bringing out ideas. Uh, um, we can overcome all these challenges and uh, get back what was once a beautiful thing, a patient-doctor relationship devoid of interference by third parties. We need that back. Patients want that back. They're tired of going into buildings where doctors are rotating. And let's get back what we signed up for when we went to professional school. Um, with that said, uh, we again, uh, we thank you all for tuning in. We look forward to uh, hearing from you. Everyone's um, contact information will be placed in the comment section below, uh, uh, depending on uh, the commissioner and the respective uh, healthcare industry. Please reach out to us, take that first step and uh, uh, drip, drip, drip. We will build an ocean. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Take care.